what I'm talking about. Well, that worked the way it was supposed to. Sorry for interrupting everybody's uh, exciting conversation, but I just couldn't wait to get to this board meeting today and get into the excitement that will be here, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's begin by calling the meeting to order and uh, do a roll call, please. All right, birthday boy Regent Drake. Here. Regent Kent. Here. Regent Sims. Here. Regent Claire. Here. Regent Kenny. Here. Regent O'Connor. Here. Regent Ferris. Here. Regent Pillen. Here. Regent Schaefer. Here. Regent Stark. Here. Regent Whites. Here. A quorum is present. All righty. <clears throat> In your materials is a copy of the minutes from our meeting of uh, June 23rd, 2022. If there are any comments or corrections, to those minutes. Otherwise, I would then entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So Hello. Move. Second. Second. Thank you. All righty. Call the roll, please. Regent Sims. Approved. Regent Drake. Yes. Regent Kent. Yes. Regent Saudi. Yes. Regent Ferris. Yes. Regent Pillen. Yes. Regent Schaefer. Yes. Regent Stark. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Claire. Yes. Regent Kenny. Regent O'Connor. Yes. Motion passes. All righty. In accordance with the uh, Nebraska Open Meetings Act, the board has posted a copy of the act on the south wall of the boardroom behind the seating area for the press. I'm sure they will allow you to uh, go back and digest all of that information if you would like to do so. We have a presentation to begin our meeting today, and uh, we are taking a risk here of bringing two chancellors <laughs> to make a presentation together, but it's a very important topic. Uh, we're talking about rural health education here and what's going on with the Med Center and UNK. So, Jeff, are you the opener? Uh, I am, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, Doug and I are going to share this, and then, of course, uh, be very pleased to entertain any questions or comments that you may have. And this is an opportunity to discuss the uh, state of health care uh, in rural and, frankly, urban Nebraska, and why the expansion of the health science education complex at UNK is, is so important. Uh, I'd like to start off just by uh, reminding all of the total complexity of the healthcare system, which includes, of course, uh, education uh, of the workforce, healthcare uh, access and quality, uh, the neighborhood and built environment, the social community, and of course, the economic stability of the uh, upstream determinants as well as the delivery system. Uh, for healthcare. It ultimately comes down to cost, quality, and access. Uh, there are uh, just a limited number of things that are critical in the foundational delivery of healthcare uh, at all levels, uh, which include everything from at the very top a sustainable workforce, quality care, modern facilities, uh, stable supply chain, advanced technology. Mm -hmm a network of collaboration, and of course, financial stability. But what we're going to be addressing this morning is the sustainability uh, and the economic impact uh, of the workforce. Uh, all of these materials are available to you, of course, but it was estimated in 2019 that were approximately 18.6 million people employed in the United States in the healthcare delivery spectrum, of which about 40 percent worked in hospitals. Then you see the other distribution in outpatient care, physicians' offices, home care, uh, et cetera. So this is a huge part of the U.S. workforce and, frankly, uh, expanding in many different ways. What I'd like to do now is just very quickly share with you some of the work done by the UNMC College of Public Health. Every two years, the College of Public Health publishes uh, a document known as the Status of the Nebraska Healthcare Workforce. I particularly chose the 2020 document as opposed to the 2022 document because this paints a picture before the COVID pandemic. And therefore, it's a more stable estimation of, of what the workforce looks like. Uh, this is a map of the counties, of course, of the state of Nebraska. 
And what you can see, uh, and all of these are in the same color scheme, in dark red at the bottom uh, would be a range that would be approximately the United States average. Uh, in clear or in white at the top would be zero. Uh, not a small number, but actually zero. So this is the first of a small number of graphics. There are actually hundreds of them in this publication. And the link to the website where this is found is at the top of this slide, if you notice it. But as you see, there are only seven counties uh, in the state that have the average number of primary care physicians as the rest of the United States. Uh, and there are twice as many counties that have zero. Now, you may be wondering, uh, how is this determined in the sense of there are many physicians, uh, in this case, that work in multiple counties. This is the county in which they are licensed. That's how this study was done. Uh, otherwise, we'd be double counting people uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is a look at some of the other areas. And uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But for instance, uh, you're looking at OBGYN. You're looking at primary care pediatrics. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you're in the middle, uh, you're looking at OB. At the top, you're looking at internal medicine. On the right side of the slide, you're looking at some of the distribution of advanced practice nurses. And I think uh, independent of these primary care specialties, which are now considered to be family medicine, internal medicine, uh, general pediatrics, uh, uh, OBGYN, uh, and general surgery has now been added to the uh, uh, cohort of primary care specialties. No matter how you look at it, uh, there are far fewer counties uh, in the state of Nebraska, frankly, including the urban counties in the state that get even close uh, to the US average. And, uh, and if you look at some of these distributions, particularly the middle uh, uh, map on the left side, which is OBGYN, you can see why the recent article in the media about roadside deliveries uh, is not a trivial concern uh, here because li to be licensed in OBGYN and practicing in rural Nebraska uh, is increasingly uh, difficult. Uh, this is a look at some of the other specialties uh, that uh, you know may be of some uh, interest to you. Uh, these are uh, what I would call the allied health professions. Uh, uh, and these include such as physician's assistants, respiratory therapists, uh, and others, and these are all part of the team uh, that delivers health care. So whether it's in nursing uh, or whether it's in uh, uh, respiratory therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, you see there's a, a there's a maldistribution, but again, reminding you that the dark red at the bottom is roughly equal to the U.S. average. It's actually slightly less than the U.S. average. This was actually one of my favorite graphics. Uh, this is. Uh, the number of licensed audiologists. Now understand we have an aging population uh, in the US and of course in the state of Nebraska. Hearing loss uh, and hearing issues are not uncommon in the ranching and uh, agricultural communities across the state. Uh, and uh, this is the number of licensed uh, audiologists uh, as of the fall of 2019 when the data was collected and published in March of 2020. So I, I guess the theme of what I'm saying, and before I turn it over to Chancellor Christensen, is we're sort of like that vehicle on that slope uh, heading towards the cliff. I'd like to think that we're uh, proceeding full steam ahead, away from the cliff. But unfortunately, over time, uh, that has not been the trend. If you look at these studies over the last decade, uh, we're actually moving in the wrong direction. To the best of my knowledge, Ronnie, the only audiology program for creating licensed audiologists uh, in the state is actually uh, given by uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Chancellor, Sorry. one quick question. On, on two year counties, what do we do on reservation type ground? Do we, do we have our people from Nebraska go across the border to the reservations, or is there, how does that, is that handled? Because some of that, is uh, on our side of the line. Yes. It's very variable, uh, Regent Kinney. Uh, so uh, we have a, a relationship uh, with uh, Winnebago's where we assist them. But generally, the IHS, the Indian Health Service, uh, is responsible for 
the delivery of care. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, if you look across the nation, there's tremendous variability in quality and access, and the Native American populations uh, struggle greatly with uh, diabetes and so many other uh, disorders uh, that uh, th they suffer from the same lack of access, frankly, uh, that the non-reservation uh, communities uh, suffer from. You know, we provide as much as we can, and frankly, uh, we receive through our Nebraska Medicine colleagues quite a few patients uh, in a given year that are transferred from the local hospitals and clinics, uh, at least locally. But, uh, you know, you're probably well aware of what's been happening in some of the other, uh, particularly western state, western part of the state and just over the western border uh, issues in South Dakota and North Dakota. Uh, the media is just full of uh, challenges in that area. So this was the conclusion uh, that was reached. This is writ again written pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, that number one recommendation was to enhance existing pipeline programs and educational initiatives uh, that incentivize individuals uh, from rural and underserved urban areas to become healthcare professionals. And indeed, that is very much the theme of why the health science education complex expansion on the Kearney campus. Uh, is so critically important. And then, of course, I would just remind uh, our regents that the world changed in the winter of 2020 when the SARS-CoV-2 virus was uh, first identified. Uh, and this is just some of what's going on on the national scene, and very much so here uh, in the state of Nebraska. This was a survey uh, that was actually done almost a year ago. Uh, which uh, indicated that four out of five healthcare workers say they've been affected by the shortage of medical professionals, uh, some of which 41% said it was a major impact. Uh, another percentage, about 20%, uh, 25%, said uh, uh, it was a minor impact, and only 21% said that they were not impacted either in shortages, uh, in access, closing services, uh, et cetera. And this was, again, a national survey of hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers. It's just another graphic from a much more recent survey uh, that looks at uh, ways, uh, for instance, how would you describe the current situation regarding staffing? Overwhelming majority, 65%, uh, said that there was a significant shortage of staffing. 30% said there was a moderate shortage of staffing. 5% said there was little or none. Uh, so you get the theme. Uh, so this is, was another survey in the center here uh, where they uh, asked a group of people, uh, well, are you thinking about changing jobs, retiring, resigning, et cetera? And one out of four at that time uh, said they would consider leaving their job. And then tragically, one out of five, uh, as of last January, have actually left their job. So in this particular survey, which again was a national survey of over 100,000 people, 19% uh, uh, of those actually quit uh, for at least some period of time. I'd like to think they're coming back now. I hope that that's uh, uh, the case. But uh, and another 12% said that they plan or have already committed uh, that they're going to quit. Some of them were actually laid off. Uh, due to uh, lack of access uh, to the system for financial reasons, premium pay, et cetera. Uh, the graphic on the left, however, I would point out to you is not just uh, a photo of a number of people, but it represents the 3,600, 550 people as of last fall uh, in the healthcare professions who actually died from COVID uh, as a result of delivering care. Uh, during this pandemic. And, you know, we talk about the frontline healthcare heroes. I mean, these are individuals who actually lost their life on the front lines of delivering care, not to mention uh, the rates of suicide, burnout, depression, and other challenges that we're facing. Uh, looking forward, uh, this was a study uh, that was done here in Nebraska uh, identifying a 2025 shortage of 5,400 nurses by the year 2025, and I would just point out to you, and this is broken down into geographic districts, and I'm sure all of you feel that, this study was done pre-pandemic. Uh, and so that's only been exacerbated 
by the tremendous number of resignations, particularly in the nursing workforce, sometimes due to lack of child care, sometimes due to uh, early retirement, but many different factors. Uh, this is part of a study that was recently published uh, by the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is predicting a workforce shortage uh, in that range between 37,000 and 124,000 uh, by 2034. I would notice uh, to you that the bright red large image uh, is exactly over the state of Nebraska there, where they are predicting a significant percentage shortage Understanding there are only approximately, I say only, about 800,000 practicing physicians in the United States. So if this was average, uh, you know, let's say 80,000 was the right number in this range, uh, we're talking about a minimum of a 10% shortage. And again, this work was done pre-pandemic. Pre and I know these numbers on these charts are very hard to read, but uh, these are the international health professions workforce for medicine, dentistry, uh, and nursing. Uh, the United States actually ranks number 24 in the world of physicians per 100,000 uh, population. And these are the top 25 for dentistry and nursing. And we are not on the list of the top 25 for dentistry or nursing, making the point that uh, if we're going to depend upon international workforce, it's going to be extremely hard, uh, increasingly so, uh, to do that. So before I turn it over uh, to my colleague and friend, uh, Chancellor Christensen, uh, I just want to reiterate that the sustainable workforce leads to quality of care and caring, which leads to the need for and the continual renewal of modern facilities, stable supply chain, advanced technology, collaborative networks of care, and financial stability. It's a never-ending cycle, but it starts with sustainable workforce. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Doug, and then I'm sure we'll take any questions you may have. Chancellor Christensen. Thank you, Chancellor Gold. And uh, I'm going to put a, a more of a local view of this and where we are and why we are and what we've been doing and hopefully where we're headed. Uh, what Jeff has outlined to you is a very scary scenario for rural Nebraska. Rural Nebraska is my home. I see nursing homes that are closing because they don't have enough staff. I see small hospitals who are on the verge of financial disaster and they can't find staff or really quality health care workers. Um, it's tough if you're in North Platte, if you're in Kearney, if you're Columbus, you're in Beatrice, even if you're in Amherst, Nebraska, to find good health care. But all those communities are blessed. It's the rest of rural Nebraska that really is at great risk here. And I love this slide that has the rope about ready to break because I think that's where we really were at. It's the future of all these communities. And so uh, President Carter had a very good view as we went into the federal funds. We should do things that only the university can solve. Only the university can solve this problem. There's no one else in the state of Nebraska that's going to address the shortage of health care workers in rural Nebraska. And so uh, it's been a 10-year project for us. Uh, it is important because it is the future of many of these small communities. The reason only the University of Nebraska is we've got a world-class medical education center, UNMC. And they're focused on, on workforce. They are not just focused on themselves. UNK's had excellent, accessible, and, and quite successful health science programs. We've been doing this for 30 years working together, but now we've put it on steroids. Why is that good? Because UNK's had a real high acceptance rate because we've, we've pushed our students. We've invested in good faculty, and it's paid off uh, to do that. So. We needed the big idea. We needed something. How are we going to address all of this? Because it, we, could, we could nibble around the edges. But we decided we're going to do something big, something that would have generational change in Nebraska. And so uh, we came up with the, the big idea. And so I want to thank my uh, fellow chancellors, because uh, uh, our first step was we had to get the priority of the university. Everybody put forward their priorities. This meant that 
every campus had what they thought was a great idea, and they were many. They were really good. But they've, they coalesced and supported this project. Without that support, it wouldn't happen. Without President Carter saying, this is what we're going to do, this is where our priority is, and go into the legislature and presenting that, we'd never be here today. And that was true of the vice presidents as well. When we had a, a retreat among the leadership of the university, uh, we came out of there with uh, the idea that this big idea was going to be our number one priority. And that meant other campuses had to put aside their good ideas. And I dearly appreciate the fact that they did that because I think it will benefit all of us. We've had successful uh, collaborations, obviously. We've been doing this uh, for some time. The Health Science Education con uh, Complex was a proof of concept. We didn't know if it was going to work to have a building on the Kearney campus and bring the UNMC uh, professional programs to Kearney. Eighty-five percent of those students stay in rural Nebraska. That's success. The cohorts filled rather, they, they were very quick. <clears throat> but we needed uh, more than just the university priority. We needed a building because we're out of space. We couldn't do this. Um, and we needed operating funds. This is a brand new operation that's going to require us to start at the very beginning and provide this quality of care. The legislature came through in spades. We owe a lot of appreciation to John Stenner, to Tony Vargas, who helped get it prioritized, uh, to Bob Hilkeman, who, who introduced the bill. Uh, John Lowe helped us uh, through the floor debate. And if it wasn't for Heath Mello and Chris Kaborik, who really ran numbers and used their magic of uh, lobbying, we wouldn't be here today either. You're starting to get the drift. This isn't one person or two people's idea. This is a total university project that only we could do. So as we uh, <clears throat> look forward, we, had, uh, uh, we needed a hub and spoke uh, process. We needed a pipeline. So we had to expand our educational infrastructure at Kearney. We've been doing that for years to get ready. We've gotten a uh, university village. We have uh, uh, done our infrastructure to get ready for these facilities. This also would help us support rural health research, something that's really lacking. And this is a great opportunity to do that. So the state of Nebraska appropriated $50 million for construction. The legislature deserves a lot of, they had so many requests. For them to, to put $50 million into this is really remarkable. They added another $10 million for IXL. Can you imagine that? The IXL, I know you've all been there. Can you imagine bringing part of that out to Kearney to help with uh, professional development of our existing healthcare workers and, and to really expand our opportunities for, uh, for education. Just as importantly, the legislature passed a bill that committed $15 million in annual operating funds. Building a building doesn't do this. We've got to have people inside that building that make it work. The legislature saw the wisdom to do that. So 500000 of that already went into pipelines this year. We're down in the 7th and 8th grades talking to people about rural health service. And we're, we're going to do that all the way to when they're a senior in college to get them to, get, to matriculate into our health care professions. Normally, you'd put that money in intent language. The legislature passed a bill, and the governor signed this bill for the operating funds. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. I, I think you should feel good about uh, the commitment that the legislature showed to us and that Governor Ricketts had when he signed that bill. Our part is the fourth part, and that's the private funds. We need to raise $35 million of matching private support. Um, Jeff has been a uh, fearless uh, champion for helping to raise that money, and he's done a tremendous job. Um, he lets me tag along. Um, I would tell you that that fundraising is promising. And I'm not the cheeriest guy in the world, but I'm telling you, <laughs> we're going to make this happen. That $35 million is going to happen. We're going to build that facility. <coughs> the 
that's actually going to take place. Um, the impact, we're going to have all the colleges of uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, I think dentistry will come. But the impact that it has to a local economy, a PA has a quarter million dollar impact. So does a nurse, a, a practice, uh, uh, nurse practitioner. A physician has over a million dollar economic activity when they come into a community. Can you imagine what that would do when we put out, we're gonna have uh, 40 <coughs> physicians when we're fully up and going here. 10 a year are gonna go out into rural Nebraska. That's an incredible infusion into our rural economy. Greater economic impact into uh, the state of Nebraska, roughly $52 million of impact this will have in rural Nebraska uh, once we're up fully going. And it really does have everything to do with the stability of a, of a good quality workforce. Why does it cost so much? Quality, quality, quality. So Jeff's got all sorts of accreditation needs that he's got to do. He's got to hire good faculty, and they just don't show up on your door, and you just can't do it two weeks before we're going to open the facility. This is a process, and so that's the reason that 2025 is the target, but we have to start working today to make sure that happens. Uh, the building will be a little bigger. It's going to look uh, hopefully similar to what the health science education complex does. Um, location is going to be just north of the health science building. If Jeff and I have our way, hopefully we can connect those two facilities and make it even more uh, uh, efficient and, and work. I'm sure those health care workers, though, buy uh, North Face coats and they wouldn't mind walking, right? I, Maybe not. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a campus within a campus. The city of Kearney has been extremely helpful. They're ready to pledge funds to help us. They're ready to uh, help with some infrastructure things, some roads and streets. You know, um, as I look forward to, uh, to this, I look back at about who all has been responsible to make this happen. The Board of Regents, you've been with us every step of the way. Don't underestimate how important that was. Every time we went to the legislature, we've been to donors, we've been to community people, their question in, is the Board of Regents, are they committed to doing this? And the answer is a resounding yes, and we appreciate that. I uh, think the other part of this is that people say, why is this so popular? Because every place that we go when we present this uh, project and we talk to them about the number of health care workers that are going to be educated in rural Nebraska, they go, yeah, that's really a good idea. Why is it popular? Well, it's fundamental to rural Nebraska. It's survival for most of these communities. But best yet is there's nobody else in the country who's doing this. You have sponsored and encouraged us, and we are on the verge of mm -hmm. doing something that nobody else in the United States is doing, and that's educating those healthcare workers and those professionals in rural areas. Many have programs, and they send them out for immersion, go out for six weeks, have an experience. We're going to start when they're in the seventh and eighth grade about talking about rural service and we're going to talk about the value of having rural health and when they matriculate through their undergraduate we're going to have to spend some more money too unk is we're going to have to continue to up our our game with chemistry and biology and life and health sciences now if we could produce another 200 nicole kents uh we'd be we'd be real superstars but that's the sort of student we're after, and that's the sort of student I think we have today, but we, we need more of them to matriculate in to do this. When people look at us and say, uh, can you make this happen? The answer today is you bet, and it's going to happen. And so uh, we want to thank everybody who was involved. Uh, again, uh, I really appreciate uh, Chancellor Gold, who has been a tremendous partner, 
he would not have to do this. But the power of collaboration, I don't think the Med Center could have done this on their own. I know we couldn't have done it on our own. But when the two campuses work together, we have the support of the president and the Board of Regents, this is good stuff. And so uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. We could talk for days about this. I know that our time is uh, limited, <coughs> but I want to end with, uh, with just our sincere appreciation that uh, only the University of Nebraska could do this, and we're going to do it. And uh, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Barb? Um, I haven't, I haven't seen, and I'm wondering the role of behavioral and mental health in this particular project. If it's in there, are you counting on that as part of the caregivers? Uh, absolutely, uh, Regent White's. Uh, there's every one of the colleges that has workforce development in the area of behavioral health is connected to that. That was a theme that uh, Senator Stinner uh, was. Uh, foundational to his uh, proposals and uh, that is also connected to the Beacon funding and other ARPA dollars that are specifically going into which will sit by the way on top of uh, this this budget but at the end of the day uh, behavioral health is one of the largest challenges I didn't show you a graphic from the uh, 2020 study on behavioral health it's in the it's in the deck uh, let me just tell you, it doesn't look any prettier than audiology, regrettably. Right. Thank you. I think there's one other piece to that is what we found with the health science education complex when we put allied health with nursing is that they became cross-trained, if you will. And what's going to happen in rural Nebraska is those nurse practitioners, those uh, MDs, those pharmacists, all those people are going to have to have some eye towards mental health. The good part is they're all going to be in one <coughs> building and they work together. They, they begin to appreciate what each other does. They're not trained in silos, so that's, that's really You know, maybe one other brief comment in that uh, Chancellor Christensen and I held a town hall county meeting last Thursday night. Uh, several of our regents were there, uh, but it was a standing room only event uh, with, uh, with our our preceptors, alumni, et cetera. Uh, Regent Kent spoke at that event, and thank you for doing that. Uh, but the enthusiasm of the community to be the preceptors for these young women and young men in these careers is absolutely amazing. And, uh, and I was just totally awed by, uh, by how much the community has, is pulling together to support this, not only financially, but equally importantly for, as a preceptorial role in hospitals, clinics, outpatient centers, et cetera, uh, exemplary. So uh, great presentation um, on behalf of not, not only the university and the uh, board, but also to the state of Nebraska. Um, thanks, because without, without this product, project and and I want to go back also to building a healthier Nebraska. We go, when we, back in 2012, when this board entered into a partnership with the state and the and counties throughout Nebraska and approved building a healthier Nebraska, that included a health care facility out in Kearney. And, and the idea was to close the gap on, at that time, I believe there was 26 counties that didn't have a health care provider. So you fast forward to today, 10 years later, and now we're down to still nothing to brag about, but we're down to 13 counties. So we've closed the gap, cut it in half. This, this project, my hope from this project is it will, it will <coughs> completely close the gap and, and be able to provide health care throughout the state. If we're going to grow our state, Health care has to be at the top. Health care, broadband, you've got to have that in these, in these counties. If you don't have it, those counties are going to die. And so that's why I'm so supportive of this, this project and so supportive of, of the, the partnership efforts between, uh, between UNK and UNMC. 
Yes, Liz. Um, this is something that I know that uh, my other Board of Regents colleagues have experienced, but everywhere I go in Nebraska, when I ask Nebraskans what their top concern is, they uh, reiterate that it's lack of access to health care. And not only is that a problem right now, but I think it creates a lot of dread for Nebraskans looking forward to the future. And I think that this project really shows what the future of the university is and demonstrates our commitment to giving back to the state. It shows that we're not just concerned about rankings or accolades. We're concerned about improving life for Nebraskans. And I think that that commitment is really at the core of what makes the university great, but also what makes our state great. So I'm very, very proud of this work. I'm very appreciative of the work that our chancellors have put in. And I think that um, this is really uh, signaling the dawn of a new era for the university. So thank you very much. Chancellors, I have a, I wonder about your strategy or how you build a strategy on getting people interested to come to Kearney, Nebraska to learn. Do you, do you look for Nicole's that are from here? Do you, uh, you know, uh, national uh, searches where people come in to, to do uh, the residencies at the Kearney hospitals, or how do you uh, build a strategy around that to make them want to come here, stay here at uh, Central Nebraska? Well, that's uh, thank you for that great question, uh, Regent Kinney. On the student side, on the learner side, the, it's a pretty simple equation. Uh, if you find people who have grown up in rural communities, whose families live in rural communities, who have roots in rural communities, if they are educated and trained in rural communities, you're dealing with a better than 50% chance that they will st stay in, in a rural community. It varies a little bit from a professional group to other professional groups, et cetera. On the faculty uh, side of the equation, uh, again, the original health science education complex was proof of concept in that there was a question as to whether we could recruit uh, top-rate faculty uh, into Kearney, Nebraska. The answer to the question is no difficulty at all. Uh, we've maintained an incredibly uh, qualified faculty. But coming back to your earlier question, if, if we could recruit a whole bunch more of Nicole Kent's, uh, we'd be in really good shape. Regent Kenny, one of the things that is easy to do is people want to be part of a winner. Success breeds success. We've had great success with that health science education complex, and it's a whole lot easier today to expand that and, and go on. I'm going to ask uh, Regent Kent, were you a K Hopper? So the Kearney Health Opportunities Program was crucial, I would hope, towards attracting her and keeping her. That takes money. We took that out of our remissions budget for a number of years. For the first time, we have a little bit of state money to do that. We're going to continue to attract those students. For us, as a campus, to be able to survive, we need to become a little more regional. And we need programs like this that will attract people from a broader range. When you bring them into our campus, they're going to stay in Nebraska. They like what we have to offer. They like the state. And so it's, it, it's a win-win for everybody. Rob? I'm just curious how many communities or counties do we have a physical presence, presence with UNMC and what type of services are we providing in those communities? We have one type of presence or another in every one of the 93 counties of the state. Uh, for instance, the Monroe Meyer Institute provides uh, services around intellectual disabilities, you know, think autism care and screening and stuff like that for literally every school district uh, in the state of Nebraska. Uh, the Med Center has well over 100 different uh, clinical practice opportunities educationally. Uh, Regent Kent, you know, has just every single one of our students has rural rotations. Uh, but we have faculty and staff and programs and for instance, we have 28 different telehealth services that service the state from border to border, uh, over half of which uh, Regent Whites are in behavioral health, uh, where we work with not only correctional facilities, schools, churches, and other groups across the state, but in 27 other fields, everything from cancer uh, diagnosis and care, tumor boards, et cetera, uh, end-stage congestive heart failure, high-risk OB, I mean, you name it. Uh, 
we either have a telehealth presence or a physical presence, uh, literally border to border, and frankly, uh, in a five-state surrounding region as well. Just to follow up on that, how many of those communities or counties do we actually have brick-and-mortar locations? For education or for uh, clinical care, Regent Both. Schaefer? Uh, I, I don't know the number for clinical care for education. Uh, we partner with hospitals, clinics, physician practices, etc. So we don't own them. Uh, we are able to, uh, through the generosity of the time of the physicians, uh, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, etc., uh, we have rotations of our students uh, in every single legislative district in the state. And I know that because I get the opportunity to meet with our legislators uh, every year and provide them with a bit of a dashboard of how many alums are in their district, how many of their students are in their district, what our employment is of individuals in their district, and the numbers literally cover every <coughs> single legislative district in the state. Thank you. Great job, people. We appreciate your time this morning and appreciate what you're doing. It uh, makes me think how important this whole process is to our university system. You know, we could be focused on one campus or we could be focused on multiple campuses as individuals, as silos, if you, if you will. But we haven't been doing that. We've been trying to focus on a university that blends together our campuses. <clears throat> and our facilities and cooperates and collaborates together. And as long as we can continue to do that, I think we can continue to make the University of Nebraska go where we want it to go. And that's to serve the people of Nebraska in a maximum way. So, um, great job. Thank you, Regent Ferris. I, I would want to leave you with the uh, <clears throat> a thought that uh, poor Heath Mello heard me say way too many times in the rotunda is, I promise we're going to make you very proud of this initiative. For many, many years, you're going to be proud of this. Barb, did you have another comment? Well, I, I just wanted to, to add that I think we also, you're doing a great job of partnering with the community colleges in the rural areas because I know the nursing program in Scott's um, is an important graduation for nurses. 47 out of 50 were staying after yes. graduation. Yeah, so uh, the College of Nursing under uh, Dean Sebastian's leadership has uh, exchanged and articulation programs with every community college, with state colleges, and of course all of the NU system. Uh, I just echo Doug's comment, we will make you proud, but uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, they are sobering for the future of the healthcare workforce in the state and the economic vitality of both our rural and urban communities is going to depend very largely upon the future of the University of Nebraska to help solve this problem. I mean, only the university can do this. All right, thank you again. Jim? I, I can't help myself, but I, I do want to say that uh, I applaud all of the chancellors I applaud the Board of Regents, President Carter. You know, this board initiated, uh, to pile on what you said, Bob, this board initiated One Nebraska about eight years ago. And uh, that meant everybody had to give some stuff up. And uh, uh, I'm 100% confident that if we did not have One Nebraska, uh, this would have been hard for maybe Chancellor Green or Chancellor Lee to say, I'm, I'm behind this. And attitudinally, uh, for the future of Nebraska, that's a big deal if we're all together extraordinary things can happen and we and we haven't seen anything yet all right thank you again as we uh, move into our board meeting for today we have a uh, policy of doing what we call kudos at the beginning of each board meeting we take some time to recognize the people who all too often don't get the recognition they deserve. Board of Regents believes it's vitally important that we acknowledge the commitment of our employees. 
as well as their contributions. So really to be nominated for one of these awards, either by a supervisor or a peer, is an honor in and of itself. As the kudos recipients are announced, we would ask you to please come to the podium here in the, in the center. There will be a regent making each of the presentations. Following each presentation, we'll take a picture out here in the, in the center. Um, the president, the chancellor, the family of the employee and supporters will be invited to snuggle in and let's see if we can't get everybody in the picture and uh, we'll celebrate what you all have done for our university. Our first kudos recipient is Chris Moran from uh, the University of Nebraska at Kearney. So it seems like we're uh, focusing on UNK and that's not because I graduated from there, but <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Regent Saadi will make our presentation. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I am pleased to recognize Chris Moran, Budget Officer at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Born and raised in Ord, Nebraska, Chris graduated from Ord Public Schools and then Nebraska Wesleyan University. She is a certified public accountant and a member of the Nebraska Society of Public Accountants and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. For the past eight years, Chris served as UNK's senior financial accountant and then accounting manager. Learning quickly, thinking strategically, and adapting to change, along with her prior roles in management while working in the public and private sectors, all combined to make her an impactful member of UNK's budget team. In 2019, she transitioned to budget director, a position held for 30 years by Jean Matson. Chris did not hesitate to exercise her Nebraska work ethic, accepting the challenge, says Vice Chancellor for Business and Finance, John Watts. She was able to simultaneously learn the ins and outs of budgeting while helping shape the budget to support UNK's strategic plan. Colleagues across campus admire and appreciate Chris for her grace, skill, and confidence in assuming the important, often difficult, position of budget officer. Her knowledge and demeanor quell the anxiety that often comes with budget questions. At UNK, Chris has been a member of the Equity, Access, and Diversity Advisory Committee and the Staff Senate. She is a graduate of Leadership UNK and of the Maximizing Organizational Resources Leadership Program. Celebrating with us today is Chris's husband, Jim Moran, along with Vice Chancellor John Watts. Our congratulations to Chris for her impressive and highly appreciated work benefiting UNK and the entire University of Nebraska community. Don't get to hide back there. <laughs> Congratulations, Chris. Now we'd like to ask Regent Kent to come and present the kudos award to Diane Feldman of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I am pleased to present a kudos award to Diane Feldman, Learning Resource Center Coordinator for the UNMC College of Nursing Kearney Division. As an LRC coordinator, Diane provides a multimedia learning environment where students acquire knowledge, 
skills, and attitudes that promote safe, patient-centered care. LRC staff also partner with faculty to provide learner-centered activities that integrate curricular concepts with psychomotor skills, behaviors, critical reasoning, and clinical judgment. Her nominator said, this building would not run smoothly without Diane. Described as the face of the Kearney program, Diane is a resource for faculty, staff, and students, and she keeps the mission and goals of UNMC at the heart of what she does every day. She wants to provide the students with the best, most updated learning resources possible. She also wants the students and staff to succeed and exceed all expectations. In addition to her LRC role, Diane assists with everything from orientation and white coat ceremonies to proctoring, working on community projects, and assisting new staff. She actively improves our nursing program, another nominator said. Please join me in thanking Diane for her dedication in helping make educational dreams come true at the College of Nursing Kearney Division. Congratulations, Diane. <clears throat> Jonathan Acosta from the University of Nebraska Omaha is our final recipient today, and his award will be presented by Regent Sims. The Nebraska Board of Regents is proud to present a kudos award to Jonathan Acosta, Assistant Director of Advising for the University of Nebraska at Omaha's Academic and Career Development Center. Jonathan was celebrated in his nomination for being a great leader, responsive to the needs of students, and his advising team while building strong relationships across campus. His nominator says that Jonathan is always learning and discovering the best practices that will better serve the students and is respected in his field, attending numerous conferences and panels to share his expertise. He was recently elected to serve as a Nebraska liaison for the NACADA Global Community for Academic Advising. Acosta has been a leader on campus through his roles of president of the UNO Academic Advising Council, his membership on UNO's DEIA Council, and as a liaison with advisors for the university's faculty senate and staff advisory council. Recently accepted into a doctoral degree program at UNO, he is also taking on the role of Im implementing new advising models for academic programs across campus. He is a friendly face on campus even when times are stressful, a nominator wrote. He lightens the mood with his jokes, builds community with his icebreakers, and informs with his great communication skills. Recognized as UNO's June Employee of the Month, his nominator stated, Jonathan is the employee every unit or supervisor wants. His dedication to UNO shines in every interaction. For all of these reasons, his commitment to UNO students and making the University of Nebraska a better place, Jonathan is recognized as a true champion of excellence in higher education. Congratulations. Yeah. We've got to stop paying our photographer by the photo. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Congratulations, all of you recipients. We are pleased to have had the chance to say thank you and congratulations for what you've been doing. While our kudos recipients and guests are most welcome to stay and observe the balance of our 
exciting business meeting to follow. If you wish to slip out the door, uh, we'll take no offense at that at all. So you certainly are free to do that if you wish. Uh, glad to have you as long as you'd like to stay. And thank you again for what you're doing on your campuses. We have no resolutions or hearings that we will be doing today, but we do have a president, and he wants to make some remarks. Thank you, Chair Ferris, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I have a few remarks to make, but first I just want to say very specifically thank you to Chancellors Christensen and Gold for their uh, incredible presentation today. I think it was informative, and uh, there's really not a whole lot more I can add that wasn't said by our board, uh, but I just want to say the word transformational is used a lot, and this is one of those things that is truly transformational. And for me personally, this is one of the things that attracted me to want to come to Nebraska and be part of something bigger than all of ourselves. And as Doug pointed out so uh, succinctly, nobody else in the country is doing this, not because they don't want to, because they just don't have the people and the will and the spirit to do these types of things. So I, I just want to tell you how incredibly proud I am. I'm proud of our chancellors and the leadership and the leadership that's here at this table that we're able to move the needle on something that's so important. I thought I'd focus uh, the majority of my comments today on budget planning. I know it's the most exciting topic we can talk about, but you know it's the right timing with the new fiscal year underway and some recent developments that are worth calling uh, everybody's attention to. In the back of your book, you're going to find our latest bond ratings report from s and I'm very pleased to tell you that we have affirmed our AA rating, and we have received very similar high marks from Moody's. So I want to just try to put that into context, because sometimes we just take for granted that we can maintain a AA rating. Uh, if these ratings were a report card on the financial condition of our university, I would submit to you that this means that we made the dean's list. These independent ratings agencies have analyzed our financials and concluded that they have great confidence in our management and our ability to pay our bills and debt. And just like having a good credit score is good for individuals, a good bond rating means we can continue borrowing money at a low interest rate. For an institution as large as the University of Nebraska, that amounts to tremendous savings for students and taxpayers. This is great news because it's a vote of confidence in the approach that we and this Board of Regents have taken in our uh, fiscal management. One of the things I've been most impressed with in my now approaching three years here is the diligence that we put into the budget process. We take a conservative view, we operate in the black, and we are always thinking ahead. What, uh, what do we need to know and how do we make sure that we are in a good position, five, ten, 15, 20, and even 50 years down the road. That approach served us well through COVID-19. When the pandemic hit, as our dorms closed and sports and events were paused and we saw we would experience fiscal stress, we sat down and built a three-year plan to get us through. Our goal was to insulate ourselves as best we could, to maintain our good position while doing everything we could to serve students and families. We said at the outset that our plan would require discipline on our part, $50 million in cuts when it was all said and done, and tough choices so that we could enact a two-year tuition freeze for every single University of Nebraska student. And we stuck to our plan. And as I look across the national landscape, I'm even more convinced of the wisdom of our approach. Cuts have not been easy. but We have to become a more effective and efficient organization, true to our commitment to Nebraska taxpayers. Let me just give you one example from the accountability measures that are built into our five-year strategy. One year ago, we stood up a new system-wide purchasing function to serve the entire university. This was not a consolidated part of the Varner Hall Office of the President at the time. In one year, we've already achieved a half a million dollars in savings through renegotiated contracts and other opportunities uh, that are, are going to yield even more savings. Our five-year strategy calls for us to grow those savings year over year, and I am very confident we'll be able to do that. Our system-wide teams in IT, facilities, and human resources have similar success stories, and these are savings we have been able to achieve without doing harm to the quality of our academic enterprise, 
our highest priority. There may be no better example of the long-term and disciplined approach we take to fiscal planning than our deferred maintenance effort. As you recall, this is a 40-year partnership with the state of Nebraska, developed together with Chairman Stinner and approved by the legislature and Governor Ricketts. This partnership is designed to address our $800 million deferred maintenance challenge with the ultimate goal of becoming self-sustaining through a unique approach of setting aside part of our budget each year for a depreciation fund. That also takes discipline, but we are determined to get out of this hole, and in my view, it's our responsibility as stewards of these valuable state resources. And our timing could not have been better. With the state's partnership and this board's leadership, we moved quickly and were able to capitalize on last year's historically low interest rates with a $400 million bond sale that is funding crucial maintenance projects across our campuses, some of which will come before you today. So let me just put this in perspective because as much as I have talked about this, I still don't know that we've gotten enough credit for this. We've issued $400 million in bonds last year at a 2.9% interest rate. That 2.9% is fixed for the next 40 years. If we were going to market today, we likely would be paying somewhere around 4.5%, and I would argue it's probably closer to 5%. Chris Cabor can speak to the details, but my simple math says that 1.5% applied to $400 million is a lot of money. <laughs> All right, so what is it? It's about $6 million more per year in interest costs. So multiply that 6 million times 40 years and you start to get the picture. That's how much we're talking about in terms of serious money that we have saved by just our timing and the action of this board. In short, our good planning is going to save us over $200 million in interest costs just by our quick action. This is important stuff that we don't talk about enough. Number one, this will save a great deal of money for the future students and taxpayers. And number two, if we were going to go to market today, we just wouldn't be able to tackle nearly as many maintenance projects on our campuses, which we need. As you've seen from the program statements from the chancellors that have been brought to you today, these are very much needed. So in short, we did strike at exactly the right time. This is a win all the way around for students, our faculty and staff who deserve high quality facilities, and Nebraska taxpayers who we estimate will see over $1.5 billion in savings over this 40-year course of this <coughs> partnership. So it's just not me saying this is an innovative approach. After I met with a team of editors from Inside Higher Ed who wrote a story about this a few months ago, we've had a number of phone calls, and these are things that you may or may not know. Since then, we've been fielding calls from colleagues all over the country who are saying, how did you get this done? Chris Kaborik just had a call from Iowa on Tuesday. We had another call from the California Legislative Fiscal Office uh, last week and another one coming up. I say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so we are more than happy to take those calls. And just as we talked about the transformative nature of this rural uh, health care facility, this is also that part of what transformation is. This type of thinking informs the biennial budget proposal that you're going to take up later. One of the things I said when I first arrived here was that we won't spend money that we don't have, and we won't ask for money we don't need. That's my pledge to the governor, to our senators, and to our taxpayers. So what you will see before you later this morning is a very modest request, 3% each year. That will help cover some of our core operating needs. In addition, we will request the funds already approved by the governor and the legislature to operate the Kearney Health Science Complex has already been addressed in additional career scholarships. I want to emphasize this proposed budget to the state will not cover all of our costs. We are not going to ask the state to fund all of our needs. We're going to have to be part of that solution. We estimate that we'll have at least $12.5 million as a gap or bogey each year that we, the university system, are going to have to make up through some combination of enrollment growth, cuts, or tuition increases. I anticipate our request will be on the low end compared to most state agencies. But this is a signal to the governor and the legislature that we will be a good partner that we recognize there are only so many dollars and that we have a responsibility, just like any Nebraska family or business, to manage our resources wisely. So I credit the board, the chancellors and their teams, our financial teams for their hard work. We're seeing results. And I can tell you that around the country, people are taking notice of what the University of Nebraska is doing. More importantly, our efforts are creating value for students, 
families, and Nebraskans. That's a great success story, and I hope Nebraskans take pride in what they're getting in return for their investment in our university. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. I appreciate the fact that you were pointing out <clears throat> a number of those items. I think sometimes our tendency is to be a little bit too humble, and we need to point it out when we have taken positive steps and they've worked, and not to be afraid to do that. So thank you, Ted. Another example of your good leadership, and I think cooperative attitude. All right. On the agenda for today, we are now down to the area, <coughs> excuse me, on public comment. <coughs> the standing rules of the board provide that any person may appear and address the board on items that are not on today's agenda for future action. Providing that, uh, they make that request with the corporate secretary at least 24 hours in advance. Each person wishing to speak will be given three minutes. Policy that's been established by this board some time ago. We were contacted by one individual wishing to speak also on a topic that is not on today's agenda. So, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kurt Geisinger, doctor. Mr. Chairman, Board of Regents, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I thank you for your service as well. Uh, I've provided a written document, uh, which I hope you all have, and I'm going to skip the first two paragraphs in the interest of time. Uh, but let me say uh, my field is uh, educational and psychological testing. I've worked in that field for some 45 years now. Um, and uh, my work started really professionally when I was still in graduate school. I ran a study that uh, uh, studied, it was a court ordered study that looked at the performance of police officers uh, who were women in the first city of the United States, Philadelphia, uh, where we had uh, police women then hired subsequently based on that court action and on the results of our study. So I've had a lot of experience working with police over the years. And for about 10 years, I built the New York City police and fire exams, defended them in court, and so forth. In addition, uh, my, per my personal area of research for about the last 30 years is testing people with disabilities and testing language minorities. And I have a number of books and so forth on those topics. Uh, and because of that work, I've been an expert witness in some 35 to 40 cases, mostly for uh, a not-for-profit law firm known as Disability Rights Advocates. And so this is a cause celeb for me. And I can tell you that uh, based on my expert testimony in court cases, the LSAT content is changing. How they score the SAT <coughs> and the ACT for people with disabilities has changed. Uh, and, and how they do certain medical licensing and certification tests have changed, all because of my uh, expert testimony and, of course, a little work by the lawyers. Uh, and that was supposed to be a joke. However, uh, in, in uh, 1995, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And if you look at my record, you can see I've really worked hard for most of my career. I've put my own health second. Um, and that was fine up until about three or four years ago when I started bleeding in my retinas. And uh, since that time, I've had six laser surgeries, uh, three in each eye. Uh, and then in the, f and, and let me tell you, I'm a student as well as a, a, a uh, professor. I would not recommend starting law school at 69, but I did two years ago, half time. And so I was taking three courses each of the last um, two years, every semester, in addition to working full time. And so I went blind at first in my right eye. And when I got the surgery within a month, they called it a vitrectomy. Uh, I saw fine after that surgery. Um, the second time I went blind in the left eye, the, the, my surgeon uh, saw me said, we're going to try more conservative treatment. He gave me a shot in an eye. And if that sounds awful, I've now had about five or six shots in each eye. One minute. Uh, and basically, uh, I uh, 
I had double vision after he finally did the surgery six weeks. It lasted about three or four weeks. During that time, I had to fill out the benefits election. And I called HR and said, could I have this in writing instead of doing it online? I was told no. I said I had some visual problem. They said, sorry, you do, do it online. And I neglected to put in a medical reimbursement account. Uh, since that time, I've spent um, the last eight months arguing with the university that this falls under the Civil, uh, ADA of 1991 or the ADA Amendments Act of 19, uh, 2008, um, which I know something about. I've talked to the law firm that I've worked with, their chief of litigation assured me, whereas I got advice from both a disability person here and a lawyer, that temporary disabilities don't count as disabilities. Indeed, I've been told they do, as long as they're tied to a major event, such as reading or a major uh, health event. And please to make sure- time, please conclude your remarks. Okay, to make sure that this is not seen as a financial matter, I'm willing to take whatever money I save on my taxes from this and make a donation to a local charity just to prove that this is a cause celeb rather than a financial matter. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, standing rules of the board also provide that if there is anyone here today who wants to address the board on an item that is on the agenda for action today, uh, they can do so. They don't have to give us 24 hours advance notice. <coughs> and uh, much like our, our last speaker, uh, we need them to come forward, identify themselves, complete the sign-in sheet, and then they are allowed the same three minutes. Is there anyone present today who would like to speak on an item that is on the agenda? Board members, you're not counted in that. <laughs> okay. Then... Uh, I think we are to the point where the public comment is now over, and it's time for us to move on to item 10, which is the consent agenda. The consent agenda, as indicated by its name, is moved and voted on as a group of items together rather than being separately disposed of in the administrative agenda where we talk about things individually. Is there, uh, are there items that any of my colleagues would like to remove from the consent agenda and have discussed separately? Anybody leaping to their feet? So I would entertain a motion then to uh, second. take action. Motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Soddy? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, I believe then that takes us now to our administrative agenda, and I will flip the ball back to my colleague next door to walk us through those items. Thank you, Chairman Ferris. Uh, we'll consider item 11A1, which is the award of honorary degrees uh, after the closed session. Unless there's an objection, mm -hmm. I would ask that items 11B1 and 11B2, approval of the 2023 to 2025 biennial budget request for the university and NCTA be considered together. Key elements of this request include a requested 3% annual increase in state support in the next biennium, plus reaffirmation of funding previously approved by the governor uh, and Nebraska legislature for the UNK, UNMC Rural Health Complex, and the Nebraska Career Scholarships. This modest increase reflects the university's commitment to be a good partner to the governor, appropriations committee, and Nebraska legislature. It is important to note that this request does not fulfill, as I stated earlier, all of the university's needs. As such, we will need $12.5 million each year of the biennium in enrollment growth, tuition increases, and or program reductions to balance the budget. The biennial request must be submitted to the Coordinating Commission for Post-Secondary Education by August 15th and the governor and the legislature <clears throat> by September 15th. 
This request was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a motion to approve no. these items? Second. I think I heard a mumble over here. That was a, a loud second that came from the other counter. Okay. Clear my any, any discussion? <laughs> I was absent at the last meeting to attend a funeral, but I think it's been some time since we've had a representative here from the College of Technical Agriculture and Curtis, and I think maybe that might be something that would be helpful to have here sometime here in the next. Absolutely. And I'll just meetings. say that we have, through all of COVID and going forward, we have protected uh, NCTA, and they have not sustained any budgetary cuts. They've never been part of the $50 million cuts that we uh, budgeted through. So we have done everything we can to uh, preserve what we have at NCTA. But I think it would be appropriate for us to look at down the road absolutely having a presentation prior to our meeting. Um, <clears throat> NCTA is doing a rather remarkable job yeah. and uh, good leadership with the, our current dean would be very helpful. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Good suggestion. Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Mr. President, isn't our next meeting at Kearney? Yes. That'd be, uh, yeah, it'd be perfect. Pretty convenient. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure that gets on the docket. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with the with the role that I sit in today, the place I sit in today, and the possibilities ahead, um, I think that the, this process uh, has been awesome in the 10 years I've been on, and uh, certainly believe in the process, but it's a start of a process. And remember, we're talking about a lot of water running down the, down the, under the bridge, uh, so I'm going to abstain this morning. The motion passes. Item 11B3 advances the UNK UNMC Health Science Education Complex Phase 2 project described in detail by Chancellors Christensen and Gold earlier this morning. This project will be a game changer for rural health workforce development. The $85 million project will be funded by $50 million from the state's Federal American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, funding, and $35 million in private support. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Call the roll. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman, maybe to, just for the process, and I, I, I think I heard from Chancellor Christensen uh, the confidence, but uh, obviously when we enact a program statement, uh, not a dime is spent until the private funding is in place. Right. Uh, in this case, uh, this was authorized to be spent before the private funding was put in place. That was part of the state law on this one. You know, I, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, so there are some where we do have that stipulation, not so in this case. So just being a devil's advocate, if funding doesn't, private funding doesn't come in play, where, where do we stand then? Well, it would be up to us to get it. It's just a matter of the time uh, for when this other funding gets released. Now, I would just say we have an incredibly high confidence level that we have the $35 million will be raised in time uh, before we put a shovel on the ground. Chairman, one more comment. In my five and a half years, I have never had a topic that had this many people on one side of the line. All right. I, I appreciate that comment, Regent Kenny, but we still have a fiscally responsible uh, job to do. So there, there can be a lot of cheerleaders, but if there's not the money, um, you know, we got we to gotta make sure we have the money. I'm going to ask uh, Chancellor Gold and Chancellor Christensen to t tackle this because they've been doing the legwork on this. I w if there's a confidence issue on this, I want to make sure we're clear where we are. Thank you, President Carter. Uh, you know, Chancellor Christensen and I have been working 
uh, very diligently <clears throat> with the private philanthropic community, both in the Kearney region and the Omaha region uh, here in uh, Lincoln uh, as well. And uh, I would characterize those conversations as extremely encouraging. However, uh, Regent Pillen, uh, should we ever get to a situation where we cannot get to the ultimate financial goal that will result in either downsizing the project, shelling space in the project, depending on future funding, et cetera. We will not embarrass the university uh, finances uh, as part of this project. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, uh, Regent Pillen. We'll, uh, we have high confidence. It's promising. Uh, it's ahead of schedule, what I would call for fundraising for this. But we need to start mm -hmm. soon. If we don't start soon, we're not going to be able to open that building in 2025, and, and many things depend on this timing. And so the fail-safe is to scale it back. Uh, there's a number of things in there that we could scale back, would not be good, would not be ideal, but it is the fail-safe. Thank you. I think that's a good indication that we are planning ahead for both the good and the bad. And we do have a plan B if it's necessary. Barb, you had a comment? Well, I just had a question about whether the NU Foundation is working on this fundraising as part of their work to raise money for the university. Everyone whose job or uh, wish is that we raise this money is working on it. Okay. Thank you. Your comments. You know, I'm not, I'm a, there's nobody a bigger cheerleader of this, but, uh, you know, the hardcore reality has got to deal with reality. And I guess, President Carter, you said it best. We don't spend money unless we have it. All righty. Let's call the roll. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. The motion passes. Item 11B4 seeks the board's approval of the program statement for the Nyhard Center renovation project at UNL. As you know, the Nyhard Center is a historic building on our Lincoln campus which served as student housing until spring of 2019. Aside from use as a quarantine space, this facility has been unoccupied by students since that time. Through the support of LB384, this $21.5 million project will transform this former residence hall into a business and assembly space focused on student support services. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a motion? I'll like move. Second? And a third or fourth. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? It hasn't been touched, I don't think, since you were in school, Jim, which was a long time ago. <laughs> 30 years before that. <laughs> <laughs> but as we talked about earlier, this is a shining example of what we are now able to do that we would not have been doing without LB384. And Ronnie, you could talk to how long you've been trying to make this a priority, and this is now a reality. Well, it's, I think all the board remembers that the honors program was located here. This was the honors dormitory on campus. It dates to 1932. Uh, it's one of our most historic buildings on campus. Uh, so a little before you, Jim, just a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it, it, we moved the honors program out, as you know, in 2019 into the Knoll um, part of the new Knoll residence complex. And we have been looking for a way to renovate this building to support students across the board with student services uh, since. So it, uh, President Carter is exactly right. Uh, this allows us the opportunity to do that and do it affordably and on, on budget. So, Any other discussion? Question, comment? Call the roll, please. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. 
Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. The motion passes. Item 11B5 seeks the board's approval to select 21V and LLC, an entity co-managed by Woodbury and WRK to develop a 16 plus acre parcel at the corner of 21st and Vine Streets in Lincoln, privately. Anticipated uses include non-traditional student housing, office, support services, hotel, senior living, restaurant, and retail spaces. In return for this master lease, UNL would receive a percentage of gross operating revenues. The university has owned this parcel since 2003 and used it for various purposes, including construction, staging, and inventory services. In 2014, the university demolished the Cushman Motor Works plant, which previously occupied this space. This item aligns with our five-year strategy effort to evaluate all university assets for potential monetization and maximization. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Now, questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Maybe comment business and finance uh, talked extensively about this project, and I think that... Uh, you know, because historically there were different views of what was going to take place with that space. And so I think it is important to recognize that the university, uh, we have nothing to do with it, that it's a, it's a, it's a long-term lease and it'll be business market's going to make it work, which could really enhance, Benefit enhance campus. So I think it's, I'm really excited about it once I fully understood the process. Yeah, we are at zero risk here but we are also in a position to benefit from uh, what a developer may be able to do any other questions comments would you please sir regent drake yes regent kent yes regent saudi yes regent sims yes. regent claire Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. <clears throat> Regent Weitz? Yes. The motion passes. Item 11B6 seeks your approval for the program statement for the renovation and expansion of the health and kinesiology building at UNO to support the research, engagement, and collaboration hub or REACH within the College of Education, Health, and Human Sciences. This $10 million project will provide new space to complement the programs uh, within the biomechanics research building and renovate space for use as labs, supporting space, and graduate student workplaces. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a motion to approve 11B6? So moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions, comments, discussion? Um, I will just add briefly that um, these are all super in line with our to improve the student experience at UNO and to provide more, um, even just with what we have currently at UNO for our students. And so I'm really excited about this. Okay, thank you. Healthy quiet. Why don't you call the roll, see if we can get a little action here. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Weitz? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. The motion passes. Item 11B7 seeks your approval of the program <coughs> statement for the Roskins <coughs> Hall renovation at UNO. This $5 million project, supported by LB384, will renovate the plaza level of Roskins Hall and transform currently unusable space into classrooms, research, and collaboration spaces for the STEM teaching, research, and an inquiry-based learning or TRAIL program. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Is there a motion? I'll make it. Second. Second? Discussion. Yes, Liz. 
I don't know how many of you have been following the news about some of the teacher shortages that we're facing in Omaha, but I think that could easily become a crisis. And I think this type of investment is necessary. It's going to create a better experience for students, and it's also going to create more interest in the program, which I think is clearly going to become a critical uh, facet of Omaha's education system moving forward. So I wholeheartedly support this, and I think it's very timely. Thank you. Other comments, Jim? Um, you know, I, I think it's always good if we can celebrate some history and past, and I had the privilege of getting to know President Roskins and with his passing in the last uh, six months yeah. uh, and then making sure that this uh, building is uh, up to speed. And again, uh, a really, really good thing and keep his look. Other comments? All the roll. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. The motion passes. Item 11B8 seeks your approval of a services agreement <clears throat> with Arrow Stage Lines to provide shuttle transportation for approximately 4,200 UNO students between the Dodge and Scott campuses daily. The proposed contract would be uh, replacing an existing agreement. This would be a three-year contract with two optional one-year renewals, which is a look-in, and carry a total contract value of $7.2 million over the potential life of the contract. Funding from the UNO's University Program and Facilities Fee, UPFF Student Fee, has been allocated for transit services. This allocation was most recently approved by the board at its June 2022 meeting. This item was reviewed by the Business and Finance Committee, and I recommend it to you for your approval. Motion. Moved. Second. Second. Questions, comments, discussion? I have a, I have a comment. Uh, you know, initially we look at this and it's, what, up to potentially $7 million. And so I did a little back of the napkin math and spoke with Chris Kaborik about it and to double check some numbers. But I'll let Chris kind of figure out and share with the board to put in perspective what this really costs per user or per student on a daily basis to be transported from one location in the city of Omaha to another class. Yeah, thank you, Regent Schaefer. Um, Seven point two million is certainly a, a lot of money. Um, Chancellor Lee and I have had several phone calls about this, but I think when you put some context around it, um, the deal is makes some sense. So um, these shuttle buses run about two hundred and fifty day, uh, days a year. So over five years, we're talking about. 1,250 days that these buses will run. So you start dividing that um, per day and per students, or 15,000 students get to, to, to use these shuttle buses. It turns out to be about 38 cents uh, a day per student. So I know it cost me $1.75 to jump on the bus here in Lincoln. I think it's $1.25 to jump on the bus in Omaha. So 38 cents a day um, seems reasonable. Parking is never, uh, is, I'm sure it's the chancellor's favorite topic, um, uh, but um, I, I think it's a reasonable proposal that the chancellor and the campus are bringing forward. In addition to that, though, it might be something where in the future we do take a look as if we were to capitalize, use this money to make a capital expenditure for parking, what would that look like and do some comparisons for down the road. But I think at least for the time being, this is the, the right solution at the right time. Uh, thank you, Regent. And part of it is um, I'm sure people are, uh, have a very good understanding about how the campus location really is. The shuttle remain is the primary connected tissue between the two sides of the campuses. But we are currently also studying if there's any other alternatives. And we go through a very uh, vigorous bidding process and we're confident this is the most affordable and economical solution to service not only our students, faculty, and visitor at the same time. Thank you. <clears throat> I had one more quick one. Uh, Chancellor, does, uh, um, to get on, do you show your student ID? Is that how you uh, get on, or how do you, how do you ride uh, the bus or get on to ride without a charge? 
How do you know it's not a resident of Omaha hopping on to go down? Um, I do believe that we show ID, but I'm sure if their visitor want to come on campus, you know, remains uh, the core of all our welcome. And I don't think that we discourage people, but I may not know that because I have not yet taken the shuttle bus. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I wondered about getting some of the locals to pay the $1.62. <laughs> Good luck. When you decide that you're going to do that, uh, Chancellor, be sure you take your ID with you. <laughs> I'd like to see a YouTube video of that. <laughs> That's a good suggestion. <laughs> Other questions, comments? I just would like to add that this is a big investment in UNO, um, but this is also going to translate to it like a huge upgrade for these shuttles. Here you are with what they look like or function like now or like what it sounds like inside of them, but our students are <laughs> deterred from writing in them because they're not pretty on the eyes. They're not necessarily like the most appealing, and so that deters students. And so if we have shuttles that students actually want to use, we're not wasting the money on shuttles that students don't use. And we're also more um, in line with sustainability efforts that less people, like, you know, more carpooling means less people in their individual cars, less um, this is going to be an investment not only in our student education, but also in the functioning of the campus overall. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, comments? Call the roll, please. Regent Sims? Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. The motion passes. All righty. <clears throat> we need to move into a closed session for purposes listed here under item C, executive. Um, <clears throat> Is there a motion to that effect? I move that the Board of Regents go into closed session. Eighty-four, fourteen, ten of the revised statutes of Nebraska, for the protection of the public interest and to prevent needless injury to the reputation of persons who have not requested a public hearing, for the purposes of holding a discuss a discussion limited to the following subjects: honorary degrees and personnel matters involving members of the university staff. There a second? Second. I would request that uh, Chancellor Christensen and Chancellor Gold remain so that we can have your presence during the honorary degree discussion, and then we'll have a, a following discussion on the contract amendment for president. And we'll get back together again later on and uh, deal with uh, action on those. Okay, let's call the roll. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Pillen? Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Whites? Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. The motion passes? Declare that we are now in the closed session. As you leave the room, please take your recording devices and personal belongings. We will reconvene after the closed session to vote on these items. Uh, we'll take a uh, I'd like to uh, <coughs> excuse us, go back to our uh, regular session meeting to wrap up the balance of what we have on the agenda. 
And uh, I would accept a motion and a second uh, on the agenda item 11A1, which is the awarding of the honorary degrees. Make it. Second. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Call the roll, please. Regent Kent? Yes. Regent Saudi? Yes. Regent Sims? Yes. Regent Drake? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. Regent Stark? Yes. Regent Whites? Yes. Regent Clare? Yes. Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, then I would uh, accept a motion and a second to approve the service agreement. Um, that's the First Amendment to the employment contract. We have to uh, approve the grant of the performance-based merit pay. Carter, and then we'd like to approve the amendment to the contract, which extends it out indefinitely. Uh, <laughs> not, not quite. Uh, Is it perpetuity? Yeah. Perpetuity. <laughs> I think was that a request for a motion to approve items 11C1 and 11C2? So moved. Second. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Liz. Um, I just want to circle back. Um, as many of you recall previously, I was the lone no vote on President Carter's compensation in 2019. I made it clear at the time that my no was concerned with the amount of Ted's salary in light of our financial financial situation. We all knew that President Carter was the excellent choice to be the university's president, and we knew that he'd be an exceptional addition. Um, it's now nearly three years later, but today we are in a much better financial position and operational position. We have more stable funding. We've emerged from a global pandemic stronger. We've implemented landmark actions like Nebraska Promise, a, su a successful bond sale, and an overhaul of our deferred maintenance structure, which will save Nebraska millions of dollars. And Ted was the driving force behind all of these remarkable achievements. Over the past three years, we've seen the impact that President Carter has made and can continue to make on our university. He's exceeded all of our expectations and elevated the university to the level that it needs to perform in order to continue to serve Nebraska. I not only feel comfortable with this compensation package, I'm happy that we have something like this. I know that the investment in our university leadership will continue to produce outstanding results for our students and our university and the state. I am thrilled to have him here for longer. I think it's desperately needed and I think we're all deeply appreciative. Um, quite frankly, I expect even better things in the next, uh, in the next several <laughs> years with Ted and I'm looking forward to it. So thank you, Ted. I just wanted to add that we're excited to have you back and renewing your contract. This is a good thing. Um, and I think that not only our system, but our community um, related to us have you and continue to have you. Um, we've all greatly benefited from Thank you. And I'm excited for you to be extended. And I also wanted to add really quickly, um, if you ask the typical university system student what your roles and responsibilities are, they might not know exactly, but I can ensure you that every student has felt the ripples from what your leadership has brought, and we're excited to continue that from leading us through COVID, from Nebraska Promise. Um, those truly impact each and every one of our students, and that comes back to your genuine focus on student needs, um, and so we really do notice that, and we're Excited to continue with you leading us. Okay, I would be happy to share a lot of the positive comments, but uh, I don't want you to get too, yeah. you know. White will take care of that later. <laughs> <laughs> but everything was positive. Thank you. And we are delighted that you are willing to have your contract extended. Have a, do we have a motion? We do. We have a motion and a second to approve items 11C1 and 11C2. Let's call the roll and get her done. Okay. Regent Saudi. Yes. Regent Sims. Yes. Regent Drake. Yes. Regent Kent. Absolutely yes. Regent Stark. Yes. Regent Whites. Yes. Regent Clare. Yes. 
Regent Kenny? Yes. Regent O'Connor? Yes. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Pillen? Yes. Regent Schaefer? Yes. The motion passes. All righty. Oh. I would just call your attention to the list of reports that's under item D. There's uh, seven or eight of them there. We sometimes don't go back and lift those up again to you. Uh, I hope you don't just quit reading when you get to that part of the agenda. But uh, there are some good pieces of information in those. And we will be coming back to share some of those with you time to time just to point out something that's, that's in there. But please don't forget. They are there, and they're not just there to fill up. Uh, please take some. Um, there are no other items of business, and so thank you for your perseverance today. And uh, this has been a good day. We've accomplished good things. Uh, closed. So. Uh, are adjourned.